is the Rebound Podcast with Coach Matt Doherty. Welcome to the Rebound. I am Matt Doherty, and I'll be your host. On this show, we focus on the topic of leadership and overcoming adversity in an open and raw kind of way. We discuss setbacks and how to rebound from them. I became passionate about leadership after losing my job as the head basketball coach at North Carolina. I was hired in 2001 and was voted AP National Coach of the Year that first season. Two short years later, I was asked to resign. That sent me on a leadership journey to find what was missing in my life. I found that leadership and the principles of leadership were some of the critical components that I needed to improve upon. I needed to learn and grow. With me today is James Worthy, 1982 national champion and teammate of mine at North Carolina. He was the number one pick in the NBA draft by the Los Angeles Lakers. He's a seven-time NBA All-Star, three-time world champion, top 75 players of all time, NBA Hall of Famer, big game James Worthy. Well, let's talk about leadership. Um, To me, when I think about James Worthy and having played with you for two years, you were a leader by example. I uh, thought you were a calming influence on our team. You weren't really a rah-rah guy unless you were dun- dunking on Ralph Sampson um, or Patrick Ewing or Sleepy Floyd. Uh, but you were the man at UNC, and everyone knew it, and you were a leader by example. Then you transitioned to the Lakers, and you have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whose nickname was the captain, and Magic Johnson, maybe one of the best leaders in all of sport. How did your leadership style change from college to the NBA? Well, it it had a lot to do, Matt, and you know this. It had a lot to do with the way Coach Smith coached us and the way he mentored us. Uh, For me, it started back when I was going to basketball camp uh, in the eighth grade, you know, learning about Coach Smith, about the system, uh, about his players, uh, you know, how teamwork was essential. Um, and so it was, it was embedded in me. So when I went to the Lakers, um, you know, I was ready. One of the reasons that they drafted me was they, they wanted a role player. Uh, the Lakers had just won two out of three championships. And, and because of a trade that happened back in the mid seventies, the Lakers just happened to get the Cleveland Cavaliers' number one draft pick. Well, at the time, Cleveland was pretty good. So getting that pick wasn't very important. Unfortunately, the owner sold the team. They went straight to the bottom, and uh, I became a Laker. So, um, you know, uh, it it was a matter of, you know, knowing how to listen, uh, knowing how to uh, get along with, with people that you may not be compatible with. You know, you didn't really have to be the same, but you had to understand what they were bringing to the table. And that was what I learned from Coach Smith, learned to be a good listener, uh, and also learned to speak honestly when called upon. So, uh, but, you know, I had seen Kareem, you know, as a kid. And so, but Magic was our true leader. Uh, You know, he had a personality that just, you know, just yielded, you know, leadership. He he just refused to, to lose. Uh, he refused to, you know, uh, have have a teammate be down. Uh, I remember I was in a shooting slump once, and I asked one of the ball boys to meet me in the gym early a.m., and instead of the ball boy uh, being there, Magic was there. Magic was my rebounder. He was the guy. So we had a lot of leaders. Michael Cooper, uh, the minister of defense, he led us uh, on the defensive end. If there was anything that – uh, needed to be handled defensively. He was the guy that was in your face. Bob McAdoo, uh, one of Coach Smith's, you know, men, spoke brutally honest. You know, McAdoo told me once, he said, you know, they'll trade you. You know that, don't you? You know, I was going through, you know, struggling about my third year, and he he's like, he wasn't having it. You know, I was trying to, you know, you know, pity myself. So we had that type of conversation, and we knew how to, we knew how to get along. I mean, we had Pat Riley, who came from, you know, Adolf Rupp. We had a few guys come from John Wood, Kareem, Jamal. Um, and then we had, you know, Dean Smith's boys, Mitch Kupchak, uh, Bob McAdoo, and myself. So we knew how to win, Jerry West. So guys knew how to sacrifice. And it was just nice that 
it was compiled all into one team and uh, very successful. James, you talked about writing a book and you touched on mental health. And I think you touched on something that I want to talk about, which I think is so important today. You know, mental health, when we were playing, it was like, just suck it up, right? Be tough. Um, but as I've gotten older, um, I think the, the negative self-talk, I say the person we spend the most time with is ourselves and mm-hmm. the things we could say to ourselves are, are, are awful. We wouldn't say them to our worst enemy. Uh, I know when I l- got let go at North Carolina, I was like, what an idiot. I should have stayed at Notre Dame. What an idiot. I should have managed, uh, coach Smith differently. What an idiot. I should have treated the former players differently or, what an idiot. I, I say that to myself, and I think we need to say nicer things to us. And I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people like yourself, successful people, and I ask them, what do they do in the morning? What's their morning routine? And they basically say three things. They pray, they journal, and they work out. And the journaling I have found has been a big help to me and praying because, you know, listen, I know you came a family of faith. Um, you know, it's we like to think we're in control, but we're not. So tell mm-hmm. tell me what your self talk is like, and what maybe your morning routine is like to help you get your mind right for the day. Matt, um, I read a book, and I wish I could remember the name of it right now. It's by an admiral, um, I think, in the Navy, I believe, and. Uh, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I make my bed. Something yes. I never did. Something that was I his never speech. Did. I never did. I, uh, I, I just left it there for days. You know, maybe I pulled the cover over, but there's something about the process of being really tired and making your bed during that process. It gets you going. So I do that, and then I talk to myself. I talk myself out of stuff, like I'm tired. How am I going to o- o- overcome this? Okay, you got to do this. I have a ten o'clock dentist appointment. I'm gonna, I'm going to cancel it. No, don't cancel it. I stick to my schedule. Uh, I meditate. Uh, I do some tapping for about ten minutes just to get myself, you know, ready for the day. And the first thing I tell myself is. No matter what happens today, you know, waking up uh, was a bonus. So whatever happens after I wake up is, is beautiful. It's never a bad day. Uh, even if you have a tough day to overcome some stuff, I just thank God that I was here to experience that. I just have days that I'm happy that I woke up and everything else that happens after that is, is a bonus. You were referencing uh, Admiral McCraven. Uh, McRaven yes. uh, commencement speech. Yeah, terrific. Make your bed. You talk about tapping. What do you mean tapping? Well, my daughters are, are you know, way smarter than we are. It's a form of meditating where you quiet and you focus and you tap certain parts of your body that ignite certain thoughts and certain, it releases certain energy. So don't look at me as an expert because I I just rely on uh, on my kids, because you got to be honest with yourself. But right now, man, I'm going, I'm going once a month um, to therapy, and I go uh, once a month with couples therapy, so I can, so I can talk to my girlfriend, and and we can grow and not waste a lot of time. You know what I'm saying? The Rebound is sponsored by Sector Spider ETFs, a unique family of exchange-traded funds that divide the S&P 500 into 11 sector index funds. You can buy just the sectors you like or customize the S&P 500 by weighting the 11 sectors to meet your financial objective. Please visit them on the web at sectorspiders.com. That's sector, S-P-D-R-S, Com. Alps Portfolio Solutions Distributor, a registered broker-dealer, is the distributor for the Select Sector Spider Trust. We talk about rebounding, and you're one of the best rebounders 
in college basketball and, and a great rebounder for the Lakers. But I'm talking about rebounding in life. And we've all, we've all dealt with rebound moments where we felt really low, lonely, a failure, hurt, disappointed, and we've had to rebound from it. Tell us of the rebound moment in your life. Well, there's been a, a few, you know. Um, I think early on in my life, um, experiencing uh, integration, uh, I went to an all-black uh, elementary school, and I can remember uh, some of the horrors and some of the anxiety and the pain that uh, that happened during that time um, when we were asked to leave our school and and go, um, you know, uh, uh, across the railroad tracks to another school. Uh, no busing at that time in 1970, 71. So, you know, imagine a group of kids walking to school and having to endure, um, you know, language and, and hateful uh, images and things of that nature. So overcoming that was, uh, was, uh, was tough. Uh, you know, we wanted to, we wanted revenge. We wanted to fight. We were, we were, you know, we didn't like what we were experiencing, but thankful for my, my parents and, you know, um, some other people that, you know, you know, told us to you know, just kind of just keep going forward. So those were, those were early things to overcome, you know, as a, uh, as, as I got older, uh, and I started to play sports. Uh, you know, I, I grew five to six inches, mm -hmm. um, you know, one summer. And so when you're taller than everyone in the seventh grade, you, you have a tendency to get, you have a tendency to get picked on a little bit and you're skinny and your shoes are big and, you know, your clothes are, you know, kind of, you know, raggedy and too small for you. You, you. you have to overcome, you know, that, but then you, you know, but then you start to, you know, grow. Um, and then injuries, you know, I broke my ankle, my, uh, my freshman year overcame that. Yeah. Broke yes. my, yeah. That was yeah, a serious, that was a serious yeah. injury, James. And that, that, that was probably maybe close to career ending for you. Tell, tell us I, about that injury. It was my freshman year. Uh, I was the second freshman, I believe, uh, after, Phil for maybe the third after I'm not sure if Michael Corn started, but uh, so uh, things were going pretty good for me as a freshman, getting some playing time. And, um, and uh, I think it was Super Bowl Sunday. I broke my ankle. They think it was a wet spot. Uh, and um, I had surgery where they had two screws in my ankle and also like a four inch rod, uh, on both sides, tibia and fibula. So I had no idea uh, what I was going to be like after that injury. My sophomore year was kind of, you know, slow, a little overweight, no mobility. Mm. Uh, didn't really have to practice. Coach Smith, you know, didn't allow me to practice that much. But we went on and I survived that year to come back. But it was a serious injury. Uh, I did not know. I think because of, I was young. And because of uh, a good medical staff, uh, I was able to, you know, re recover from that. So, but, but, but injuries was something to overcome because at the time you think that your career is over. Uh, it was a blessing in disguise too, because while the team was on the road, uh, I was back at the dorm without my teammates. So I got to know other people and, um, got to realize that, hey, you know, the true meaning of me being here was to be a student athlete. Coach Smith made sure of that, but I really started to focus on, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what if I don't play basketball anymore? Yeah. So I, I, it was a blessing in disguise. Uh, and then my rookie year in, in the Lakers, I broke my leg. Uh, you know, Where, so where'd you break your leg? Where, what part I, of you? I broke my tibia I was on the outside of my leg, I believe, in the knee. And uh, they inserted two screws in my knee. So I played my entire career uh, with those two screws. The college injury, they took those metal out. They took that metal out uh, after the season, uh, 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 before the, my sophomore year. 
but the screws in my and my knee stayed in forever. I just had those taken out a few years back when I had a knee replacement. But overcoming injuries, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are those are those are things that you know I've had to overcome. And then as you grow older, uh, you know, you for me, I, I you know, I, I I was married young. Um, you know, you know Angela very well. Yep, and, cheerleader, beautiful you know, cheerleader at North Carolina. Yeah, yes, and you know we have two beautiful daughters, but. I had no idea, like, all I was up until that was a ball player. Yes. And I had carried all this. I had a winning formula. Like, I had learned, like, I just remember in the eighth grade, people who may not have been as nice to me. I, I mean, I know certain certain areas of town where, you know, you would hear things that you shouldn't hear as a kid. But all of a sudden, they started to like me, and I couldn't figure out uh, why. And then I realized it's because I was I was playing ball. I was kind of popular, and for the county and for the school, I was representing the the you know. So that kind of weirded me out a little bit. Um, so as I as I got into marriage, I really hadn't had any experience. Mm -hmm. Now I make I make no excuses because I had awesome parents, but in our household, uh, we never really had like family forums. We really, there wasn't a lot of discussions. Uh, my, my, my dad, who I think is, was the smartest man uh, ever. He had an eighth grade education, very quiet. My mother uh, was just a beautiful soul. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so growing up in the South, man, sometimes you bring some of those characteristics along with you. Like we didn't really have like a lot of conversations. So I never really learned how to survive uh, within a marriage. And so you, I found you, myself. You yeah, were how ahead. old? How old were you? Got married. Twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah. Yes. 22. Wow. And you had already played one year with the Lakers? Yes, I had played two years with the Lakers. Two years. And I had been in Los Angeles uh, as a single man, even though I was totally committed to Angela. But I told myself, you better hurry up and get married or you're not going to survive. <laughs> well, I, I can only imagine, you know, I've, I've seen – you know, a lot of people have seen shows about the Lakers and the Showtime Lakers and what it was like after the games at that, uh, you know, at, at the, the Coliseum, um, the parties that bus would have. You know, you were you were the the hottest thing in the country and in L.A. with all the glitz and glamour and I imagine yeah. the temptations uh, yeah. that that would be hard for anybody to deal with it was it was it was you know being with the lakers or being with a professional sports team or being a musician or rock star was just a bonus but the 80s the decade of the 80s the 80s was, they were good time they were good time was james off, was off the hinges so if you weren't grounded and yeah. if you weren't um you know if you didn't know if you didn't have a voice which i didn't have I didn't know how to live. And then so later on, if you add, you know, alcohol and you add, you know, your frustrations. So I never wanted to like hang out at strip clubs or really like, you know, have multiple kids with multiple women. So I got I got caught up a few times in soliciting for prostitution. Wow. And, and, and thank you for admitting you know, that. It was, it was, uh, it was a tough time for me because I knew that I wasn't raised that way. And I knew if I, all I had to do was say, I want a divorce. I want out of this marriage and then I could do whatever I wanted to do. But when you have, develop a way of living and you don't know how to speak and you don't know how to genuinely live within. And so that's what my book is going to be about, especially for, especially for black men who have always run away from any type of uh, therapy or mental health. You, what you do is you, you learn how to live. You have a winning formula. It works. 
when you're out there in public and you're with your friends, but when you get alone in those dark places and your mind starts to go all over the place, that's when you might start drinking. Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people take it deeper in drugs or whatever it may be, domestic violence. You know, it, I, I was fortunate I never hit none of those uh, areas, but you have to be true to yourself uh, and you have to be able to reconcile with things in life in order to move on. Otherwise, it's just going to, you know, it's like when you get cut and it's, you have a scar and it's bleeding, an open wound is not good. Yeah. Okay. I, I have, and I think a lot of people have uh, scars that they're never going to go away. Like where I had my knee surgery, there's a nice stitch there, but it's not an open wound anymore. It's not bleeding. So I don't have to right. carry that, that weight anymore. I kind of have reconciled with it, you know, uh, genuinely and honestly. And if you don't do that, you'll carry it for the rest of your life and you'll, you'll never know what's affecting your relationships or why you can't you know, really move forward in life. So I've been very fortunate to uh, honestly, and, and I think, you know, playing for a coach like Coach Smith, uh, you know, being able to call back on his philosophy of honesty and straightforwardness uh, has really helped a lot of us, uh, you know, continue our lives. Yep. No, we were blessed. I'd like to do a deeper dive at another time. But two minutes left, I have one question. What should I have asked you that I didn't? Uh, you should have asked me what kind of guy was Matt Doherty to, uh, to play with and be a sweet mate with, and uh, that, right. that was one. You should we have were sweet that. mates. What would be yeah, the answer I, I, to that yeah, question? That. James, that, what, that should have been. What, what would, that, okay, I'm gonna ask you. What was it like being a teammate and a sweet mate to Matt Doherty at the University of North Carolina? Okay, first of all, we won it, Matt. Coach Guthrie and Coach Smith told us a lot about the kid from New York and uh, how disciplined he was, and that's what we wanted. Great. Okay, so we knew he could play. We knew it was confident. We knew it was a great teammate. You can see that in the Georgetown game and his whole – uh, you know, his whole career, even, you know, even when he coached there, we could still feel I, I love the Carolina product. So we, we knew that as a sweet mate. Uh, I think it was the first day of college, first day of classes. This is like nothing but party time. So uh, Brad, I, Jimmy Braddock, was, there's about five of us right next door to Matt. Right. And so it was only like eight feet a bathroom that separated the rooms. And so we were, you know, we were young and crazy and wild. We were, you know, drinking some beer and having fun. And, you know, we, we hadn't even had our first hey, Wrap it up, yet. James. And, and wrap and about, it up. Wrap it up. And about, and, about, and, about, and about midnight, Matt comes in with a serious face and he says, uh, hey, guys, uh, I have an 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was this pause for like eight seconds, and then we just fell out laughing. On the you board. laughed. Funny. You and Sam and Brad oh, just laughed at me, and I couldn't get oh. mad. I just put my head down, oh. went back to sleep, put the pillow over my head. To, James, to this day, man. To this day, we knew we said we're gonna love this guy. Is it? Yeah. And you know, Matt. Matt threw some nice dimes too, man. He, he's a nice dime dropper. One more question. Who's a better passer, Magic Johnson or your guy, Matt Doherty? I would have to say it's a tie. <laughs> it's a tie. I'll take both it. of you had no-look passes. I, I was going to say in the Georgetown game, you look at the 82 game, Matt, Matt has some nice little touch passes. But I have to say over time, I played 10 years with Magic, man. 6'9", yeah, 6'9", six, well, nine, six, nine, can see the court. Awesome. James, thank you so much for your time. It's been great to reconnect with you. Yeah, brother. This has been The Rebound with Matt Doherty and special guest, Big Game James. Leadership is a learned behavior. You're a leader, whether you're a parent, a coach, a business owner, or a friend. We all lead in some way, shape, or form. 
Thanks for listening. I welcome any and all feedback. You can reach me at dartycoaching.com.